death of Peyton G. Ra. Uh, with me today is Commissioner of Public Safety Keith Flynn, uh, Lieutenant Jim Cruz from the Vermont State Police, who conducted the investigation, and whom you'll hear from shortly, De Chief Deputy State's Attorney Mary Morrissey, Deputy Commissioner of uh, Department of Children's and Family Cindy Wolka, and Karen Shea from DCF as well. As many of you will recall, uh, we held a press conference about a month ago announcing the criminal charges against Natasha LaForce into the death of Peyton G. Ross. She was charged with second degree murder. We also charged uh, Tyler Shequin uh, in that case as well. At that time, we asked the Vermont State Police to conduct a separate independent investigation, not only, not only into the death of Peyton G. Ra, but also to investigate every state agency that had any contact with Peyton G. Ra and his family from the date of his birth to the date of his death. And that, that, is what, that is why we are here today to discuss that report that was done independently by the Vermont State Police, again by Lieutenant Jim Cruz. Uh, first, let me offer my thanks and gratitude to Commissioner Keith Flynn uh, of the Department of Public Safety for uh, his leadership on uh, this issue uh, and his willingness to do this. Um, we're also here because, as we, as we said at the outset, we want to be transparent uh, about this case. Uh, obviously, because there is a pending criminal charge, um, there are some things that we cannot discuss, and uh, I know each of you will respect that. Uh, also, under statute, typically we cannot release this information uh, because it deals with DCF, it deals with minors, it deals with family court proceedings, which by statute are confidential. And the statute requires that we, if we were to release any of this information, uh, we would need the consent of the Commissioner of the Department of Children's and Families, Dave Yacovone. Uh, I can tell you last night I spoke to Commissioner Yacovone uh, and he did indeed give me his consent to release this information. Uh, I want to publicly thank uh, the Commissioner uh, for that agreement, again for his uh, leadership on this issue and his commitment to being as transparent uh, as we possibly can be regarding this issue. This is uh, a case and obviously the recent uh, cases in the state of Vermont are of the utmost priority. Uh, for all of us, not just in the criminal justice system, but in the entire, in the entire state government about not only the well-being, uh, the safety of our children. The first question that we asked ourselves based on Lieutenant Cruz's report is, should there be any criminal charges brought against anybody in connection with this state? Specifically, <coughs> should there be a criminal charge brought against the DCF worker uh, who was previously named John Salter uh, for his actions on the date that Peyton Gira died? The short answer is no. There is no criminal charges in this case, nor should there be. Uh, I think the report which will be released uh, at the conclusion of this press conference uh, will clearly illustrate that John Salter performed his duties. He did everything that he was trained to do. He did everything that he was supposed to do. He followed those protocols that DCF has. We can certainly have a discussion, and we will, about whether there are changes to those protocols. And we all know that uh, many legislative leaders are convening uh, on that question uh, as, as we speak. The criminal charge that we looked at uh, that would have been the most appropriate had charges uh, were warranted was neglected duty. Uh, and that criminal charge is, is, is exactly uh, as it sounds. It's a public official not performing uh, his, uh, his duties and whether or not he was negligent uh, in those duties. As I said, John Salter was anything but. The protocol for DCF is when there is a documented report for physical abuse, they have 24 hours to respond. All other reports is about 72 hours in order to commence the investigation and five days uh, to view the child. John Salter was at this house within 48 hours. He did his job, he performed his duties. Um, he will not be criminally charged. 
at this time, I asked Lieutenant Cruz uh, to say a few words about his investigation. State's Attorney Donovan said this investigation was to look at the fact pattern involved in this investigation and compare it to the statutes that we were looking at for potential criminal charges only. And that's what I'll talk about and entertain questions on now if you've got them. Specifically on the fact patterns in, the, in, in this case. Are there any questions that I can answer? Was John Salter the caseworker um, <coughs> for uh, Peyton and his family all the way through from birth to death? No. John Salter's involvement uh, uh, basically became, uh, he, John Salter became involved after April 2nd of this year. Who, uh, uh, did he replace someone else? Because he, the child had previously been in state custody. The child had previously been in state custody, but the investigation clearly shows that at the time of the child's death, Peyton Giro was not in state custody okay. and had not been in state custody for over three months. Was it unusual for Mr. Salter to be the one that would go out on that call? No, it is not. Although he's a supervisor, am I right? Yes. Over the course of the investigation, was it determined whether or not the child was still alive while he was in the house? Through the course of the investigation, we're not able to make that conclusive determination one way or the other. Then what, I guess, then leads you to not bringing charges? As you see from the fact pattern that's outlined in the report that you'll get momentarily, uh, there was no indication uh, that John Salter missed anything on the day of the visit on April 4th, 2014. <coughs> he did what he was supposed to do, and it was after the fact and after he had left the house that a call was made to 911. What was he supposed to do? Again, that's uh, DCF protocol, and if you want the specifics of that, we can ask uh, Deputy Commissioner Wolcott to address that with you. One thing, TJ, you said sure. that they have 24 hours to yep. respond to physical abuse, but you said Salter responded within 48? Yeah, well. So, documented physical abuse. And I think the report from the hospital, and let me say this, that um, the other issue here uh, was did everybody follow the mandatory reporting law uh, that, they were, that they were supposed to? They did, specifically the hospital. The hospital did uh, the right thing in making the call to DCF. Now, the issue is documented physical abuse. This was an injury, um, bruising, Peyton's neck from unknown origins. Uh, they did not know how it occurred. The report to the hospital from uh, Peyton's mother uh, was he was lethargic uh, and, and was having trouble walking. Uh, the hospital did its examination. Uh, they determined that uh, he could bear weight on his leg, uh, but the unexplained bruising to his neck is what prompted uh, the call, uh, but it wasn't documented physical abuse, therefore it falls within that 72 to 5 day period. I mean, unexplainable bruises on a child's neck, though, how is that not considered? It's not documented physical abuse. I, I mean, and that's, I think that's the question here. And I don't think that um, it's fair to put that burden on the attending physician where you don't have the evidence that it's physical abuse at, th at that stage. The fact of the matter is, the question for the hospital is, did they do their duty, which was to report this to DCF? They did. The second question is, did DCF respond? They did. And when John Salter went to the house on the date in question was, did he conduct the, the, the examination, the physical examination that is <coughs> consistent with the, his department's protocols? He did. Because of that, there is no criminal charge. We can disagree whether or not this is the right protocol or the wrong, wrong protocol, but the fact of the matter is that's the protocol. And in order, if we're looking at the neglected duty, we're saying, did this state official perform his duties consistent with how it's outlined? He did. There's no, there's no, there's no crime. I, I, it's hard to understand if a child has been, if the state now alleges that this child was severely shaken and head slammed into the floor prior to the arrival of Mr. Salter, that he did his duty by looking at the baby and walking out of the apartment. I don't get it. Sam, I think the question is whether or not there should be a change in protocol. 
specifically, should there be a hands-on examination to check for alertness? I think that's a discussion that should be had. Uh, I spoke with um, the general counsel of DCF last night, and I suggested that that should be a discussion. There's certainly going to be a different side to that, I'm sure, but at least let's dis discuss it. And I think that's the commitment that we're trying to make um, with this press conference and being transparent is let's get the right answer here. Let's figure out what's best for Vermont kids. There is no wrong answers right now. Let's have a discussion where we made mistakes. Let's admit it. Let's move forward. But let's have an honest discussion, disagreement if we have to, about what is the best protocol that is going to protect kids. The fact of the matter is the protocol that existed on the day that Peyton died did not require that. Did not require him to touch. Did not require physical examination. It didn't require, but could they have done that if they felt that that was something that you know? I can't. Done? I can't answer that because the question. The question is the per performance of his official duties. That, that is the question. So, what is the protocol if somebody observes bruising around the neck of a child, <coughs> oh, a DCF that. worker? Um, we don't have specific protocol on that specific issue. Um, what we had here is a child who was seen by a medical provider on Wednesday evening, um, who was cleared medical, medically, who observed a positive relationship between the child and the parents. Um, so certainly when John went out on Friday, he, he did observe the bruises, in fact. Um, and he had a child who had been very sick, um, again, was medically cleared, um, who was napping. Um, so his plan would have been to return to the home um, again and to also check with other people that would have been involved with the family, um, check back with the doctor, perhaps the child care provider, that sort of thing. Um, so that is <coughs> what I can tell you about that. Now, Cindy, one of the um, <coughs> things that I think a lot of us are still sort of trying to wrap our heads around is, is a comment that was that John made to a Detective Schweitzer in that in the, some of the original police paperwork, uh, he said, do I know that he was still alive? No, I don't. The point is, is he left the house not even knowing if, if this child was dead or alive. Is that policy, to leave a house if you have a question as to whether the child is still alive? That's a retrospective statement I think it's important to understand. When he was interviewed, um, he, he knew that Peyton had died. So if you're looking back at a situation um, and you're looking at a sleeping child um, and you're questioning in your own mind, well, what did I miss? And um, I know John to be a dedicated professional and I know that this has been agonizing for him to think about in retrospect. So I believe his comment really reflects that. Let me, can I just address that? And I, we can't take things out of context here, let's be clear. When John Salter left that house, he didn't know Peyton Jira was dying or dead. He thought he was sleeping. It goes to the earlier, so it's not, I knew he was dead. That is after the fact. Let's be very clear about that. He observed child sleeping. He asked the mother to show him Peyton Jira's neck. She manipulated his neck in a very gentle way. The bruising on the neck ooh, appeared to be old. They did not appear to, appear to be recent bruising. Um, that was the report from the hospital. The hospital cleared them and released them. But because of that bruising, they still made the call. But John Salter, at that time, he was in that house in Winooski, thought he was observing a sleeping baby who was sick. It was only after the fact did he begin to question himself whether or not he missed something. I think it's very important that that's in the proper context. He, did not, he was not looking at a di dying or de dead baby. Let's also point this out. Even if the protocol were different, I am not sure the outcome for Peyton G. Ra would have been different on that dating question. Was there any... Um in the investigation, did you look into whether or not this was a good decision to place Peyton back into the home um, in the first place? You know, I think that's outlined in Lieutenant Cruz's report. Um, and I think it's fair to say um, 
that every benchmark that was set by any stakeholder in our system, meaning not only DCF, meaning the court system, was met. And the people, the state government workers that touched this case in each and every aspect along the way, they did their duty. And nobody, no, let, me, let me finish. And then nobody would say, nobody could have predicted this outcome. This is a tragedy. Every person <clears throat> who's involved in this case is questioning themselves. In the, that, and that goes with this business. In the last you report, say there was no criminal wrong. I said, oh boy, we shouldn't have done it that way, but it's not criminal. You know, my job is criminal. <laughs> So I can't, I can't, I can't answer that. And in, in the aftermath of the, uh, the the Desiree Sheldon case in Rutland, I mean, that report talked about the different agencies not talking to each other, not good communication. Do you find any of that in this case? Yeah. If I can just sort of jump in here, because uh, we anticipated there'd be similarities drawn between the two and comparisons drawn. I want to be very clear about the, what the state police task was in this job. In, in this investigation, our task was not to look beyond the facts, to look at the facts, determine what the factual basis was, be able to present that factual basis so it could be reviewed by the state's attorney, so it could be reviewed by DCF. There will come that conversation at some point as to could there have been a better way. I know there's certainly a committee within the legislature that's looking at that now, but our focus was very narrow here. What are the facts here? What are the facts of this particular case? Not unlike the investigation that we did in Rowland. The conclusions that can be drawn from that in regard to policy, those would best be left to DCF and the policy makers, but that is not where we took this investigation. We had a very narrow scope with a very defined purpose. Was, it, was this more narrowly focused, this investigation, than the Desiree Sheldon? No. Investigation? No. Facts. So, we were looking so. to report the facts with a verifiable timeline of events as they occurred, what involvements occurred from various state agencies, state employees, and chronicled those through so we'd have a clear understanding as to the processes. So have, have any lessons you've learned here? I don't know, this question. I don't know if now's here. I don't know if now's the time for lessons or if we'll be able to, as this moves forward, because as you know, there's a, there's a criminal case going on in regard to the, to the homicides, but certainly if we don't learn from this, then, then shame on us, because any incident that occurs, any investigation that you have, especially when it deals with the welfare of children, you need to learn from those. We need to get the best results we can for the children of the state. And we need to do that by looking at cases, learning the lessons that needed to be learned, and incorporating those into our day-to-day -day operations from a police perspective, from a DCF perspective, from the court perspective. We need to get better at how we keep children safe. And that's the lesson that I hope we learn Keith, as we move the, forward. Uh, press conference uh, regarding Fletcher Allen and uh, based on uh, their examination, uh, Fletcher Allen uh, made the right call because they called and that's how the system's supposed to work uh, and I think again as Commissioner Flynn indicated it really is about lessons learned here and it is about communication um, and I think when you get to Lieutenant Cruz's report you'll see at the end uh, the conclusion that uh, everybody did what they were supposed to do in this case um, and that says to me that um, not only the DCF district office, the court <coughs> system, the prosecutors, um, the child's attorney, everybody communicated and the process worked the way it's designed to work. Can it work better and more effectively, as Commissioner Flynn said, with a goal of lessons learned that we protect every child in this state? I hope so. We are not uh, infallible and we make mistakes uh, and the system can always be improved. And I think, again, the commitment to doing this, 
to releasing a report to calling the DCF commissioner and asking by statute, will you consent to the release of a confidential report, is we are trying to be as transparent with the public as we possibly can within the letter of the law in order to make our system more effective with a goal of protecting every child that lives in this state. That's the goal. That's what we're committed to.